Max Black, The Identity of Indiscernibles, from 1952, an article that set the terms of the debate over a particular principle in metaphysics. Also, a rare but not unheard of thing in contemporary philosophy. It's a dialogue. It's also very fun. This is uh, probably one of the very most fun thought experiments uh, ever concocted by a philosopher. Even for those who like metaphysics, the thought experiment of Castor and Pollux from Max Black's The Identity of Indiscernibles is uh, more fun than metaphysics usually is. Now, before we can uh, talk about that thought experiment or about the dialogue, I must explain three principles that are involved here. The first principle is bundle theory. Bundle theory is the view that there is no substance underlying the properties of a thing. A thing just is a bundle of properties. So this whiteboard marker here has the property of being um, oh, more than three centimeters long, being more than uh, half a centimeter in diameter, being uh, less than three kilograms in weight, and so on, having some blue and some white and some black and some red on it. These are all of its properties. Well, these all are its properties, and it has more properties. What is it that actually has the properties? Is there a thing here having the properties is the question. And according to bundle theory, the answer is no. Now let's rewind a bit. Before bundle theory became prominent, uh, in, uh, in English-speaking philosophy at least, there was a different theory. In John Locke's metaphysics, there is a substance that has all these properties, and the substance has the properties, and we know the properties, but we don't actually know the substance. If you list all the different ways we might know something, you'll find that all you've listed are the properties. The substance must be there. Otherwise, there can't be anything to have the properties, and then there can't even be properties. But the substance which underlies the properties is not knowable. All we know are the properties. The substance is something we cannot know. And its properties or its attributes are the, are the things we do know. The substance is this unknowable, imperceivable, and even unthinkable thing. We can understand that it exists, but we can't understand any of its characteristics or anything about its nature, except that it's something that has the properties. Now, Locke says this. Now, this is a bit of a problem, uh, or at least a situation. And uh, one natural response is to say, well, if we can't know it, just get rid of the idea of it. And so Barclay does this for physical substances. Barclay keeps the idea of spiritual substances or mental substances, a mind which underlies all of our perceptions. Hume comes along and does the same thing for the mind that Locke did for physical substances. So both of them are bundle theorists for physical substances. And bundle theory is the theory, again, that there is no substance underlying the properties. The whiteboard marker uh, is not a substance or an essence having the properties. The whiteboard marker just is the collection of all of these properties. Now, next principle, the indiscernibility of identicals, also known as Leibniz's law. This principle states that no object has and does not have the same property at the same time. The use of this principle is this. We can use it to determine that two things are different. It's used to distinguish things. A little more formally, the principle states, if any x has any property which any y does not have, then x is not identical to y. For example, Descartes uses this principle when he establishes that a person and a body, or a mind and a brain, are not the same thing. The person, or the mind, has the property of being able to exist apart from the body, but the body can't do that. The mind can exist apart from the brain. The brain cannot exist apart from the brain. This ability to exist apart from the brain is a property of the mind. The brain doesn't have that property. No two things, uh, no one thing, has and lacks a property at the same time. Therefore, the mind and the brain are two distinct things. Now, philosophers agree on Leibniz's law. They do not all agree on bundle theory, and they do not all agree on our next principle, the principle of the identity of indiscernibles. Leibniz's law is the indiscernibility of identicals. This next principle, which we call PII for short, PII, the principle of the identity of indiscernibles, states, no two objects have all the same properties at the same time. This principle is the converse of the indiscernibility of identicals. 
Indiscernibility of identicals, or Leibniz law, says that all things that are identical have the same properties. PII says all things that have all the same properties are identical. Now this principle, if it's true, would also be useful. We can know how many things are, there are in the world by observing that they don't have any properties distinguishing them. Uh, if we observed that uh, some X and some Y had no properties distinguishing them, we could conclude they're the same thing. If, uh, if for example, mind and brain could be shown to have all the same properties, then we would properly conclude that they are the same thing if we apply PII. Now, a little more formally, the principle is uh, if any X and any Y have all the same properties, then X and Y are identical, the exact converse of Leibniz's law. Now, philosophers disagree on PII. They disagree on bundle theory, and they agree on Leibniz's law. And bundle theorists support PII. If a thing just is a bundle of properties, then by definition, since that's what an object is, any object which has all the same properties is the same object because it is just the bundle of properties. So bundle theory entails PII, and now we can talk about the text. Max Black's The Identity of Indiscernibles is a conversation between two metaphysicians. They don't have very uh, clever names, they're just called A and B. A is a bundle theorist. And so he supports PII. B is opposed to bundle theory, and he opposed to PII. Now, they have a wonderful conversation about this, and it's highly recommended reading. But the heart of the text is B's counterexample to PII. B says, imagine a possible world, a possible universe, in which there are only two objects, one sphere and another sphere. They're located a certain distance apart, and they're both perfectly spherical and they have exactly the same color scheme, and they have exactly the same size, and since they're both perfectly spherical, they have exactly the same shape. And for any other property you like, uh, weight, density, or anything else, they have all the same properties. So one sphere over here, another sphere over here, and they have exactly the same properties. How do you tell them apart? Obviously, they're two separate spheres, but they have all the same properties and you can't distinguish one from the other. So obviously, PII is mistaken. Thus says the character B in Max Black's dialogue. Now, uh, these spheres uh, don't have any properties distinguishing them according to uh, the terms of the thought experiment. Uh, you can't say that one is left and one is right because there's nothing else in this world for them to be left or right of. You can't say, well, maybe uh, the Starship Enterprise visits this world and um, uh, and Captain Picard points to one sphere and says, that sphere on the left there, look at that sphere. And then that sphere is the property of being pointed at by Picard, but the other sphere does not. Well, you can't say that, because according to the contours of this particular thought experiment, there is no Starship Enterprise visiting this world. It's just this universe with nothing in it except the two spheres. Now, in order to think of them as separate, in order to speak of them as separate, we pretend that they have names. If they had names, unless they had the same name, they would not be part of this world. Uh, if this one has a name that this one does not have, then, well, you could distinguish them by their names. You can't really do that according to the contours of the thought experiment. But if you pretend that they have names, it's a little easier to talk about them as two separate spheres. And so, we pretend that they have the names Castor and Pollux. So, Castor over here has all the same properties as Pollux over here. Or is it Castor over here and Pollux over here? We don't know. But anyway, they're two distinct spheres. They have all the same properties, and accordingly, PII is false, and with it, bundle theory. The main argument, then, is this. If bundle theory is true, then PII is true. If PII is true, then non-identical objects do not have all the same properties. The spheres Castor and Pollux are not identical, yet they have all the same properties and only the same properties, all and only. So PII is false, and so bundle theory is false. Thus, B argues against A and Max Black's The Identity of Indiscernibles. But wait, there's more. Uh, but stay tuned for what is more. There's a lot more.